Welcome to the Published Author Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to write a book and leverage it to grow their business and make an impact. I'm your host, Josh Steinle. Welcome to the Published Author Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to write a book and leverage it to grow their business and make an impact. I'm your host, Josh Steinle. And today, our guest is Ryan Foland. He's the author of Ditch the Act, Reveal the Surprising Power of the Real You for Greater Success. Ryan teaches people how to build their brand, get featured in publications, and grow their social media following. Ryan's clients include New York Times bestselling authors, venture capitalists, and Fortune 500 executives, and myself. I've actually hired Ryan before. He was a, uh, what's the word, the MC at one of the events that I hosted a few years ago. And he's also spoken at another event that we had in China, which is a whole story in and of itself. But Ryan is also a great speaker. He's a four times TEDx speaker, which might be some sort of record. <laughs> and he's been featured in Inc., Entrepreneur, Forbes, Mashable. Ryan, welcome to the Published Author Podcast. Well, thank you, sir. It's great to be here. And, uh, you know, I've appreciated not only opportunities that you've brought to my table, but uh, I'd love to see how you continue to help people grow their influence. And I, I think that uh, we've always worked well together and we're sort of after the same thing. And the the one filter that I try to put on uh, the lessons that I teach is just the importance of being honest with yourself along the way so that you don't get caught in a spot where there's a disconnect between who you really are and the message that you're actually sharing. And for those of you who are not watching the video of this, you're listening to this, Ryan is wearing a bumper sticker sized sign on his forehead that says Ditch the Act, the title yeah. of his book. It's actually a bookmark that doubles as a bumper sticker for the forehead. And it's a great piece of technology. You know, it's a, it's this thing where there's no RDIF chip, there's no battery, there's no USB-C plug-in. But if you open a book and then you put it in the pages where you left off and you come back, you open it and it keeps its place for you. It's just revolutionary. That is super convenient. I'll have to get one of those, <laughs> try one of those out. I'm a little behind the times on technology, but I think I can handle this. <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan, tell us about your upbringing. I was, I was reading your biography on your website, which I had never gotten all that background before, even though I know you. And I'm reading all this crazy stuff about your life, but I want to know, let's go way back to the beginning, like childhood, like where did you grow up? What was your home life like? How did that influence you? And what did you want to be when you grew up? Totally. So boo -doo, boo -doo, boo -doo, as we travel back in time, <clears throat> I grew up in, uh, you know, in Orange County in Huntington Beach uh, on the water, which was very fortunate. And both of my parents were educators. And I think that really stitches back a lot of who I am today. Not only valuing education and being passionate about teaching, but also getting in a cadence of working really hard for part of the year and then taking a summer and just relaxing. And so this is something that as a kid worked in my advantage, but also uh, became an Achilles heel as I went through elementary school. So each summer we would literally pack up, jump on the boat, sail over to Catalina, my favorite spot where I still spend a lot of time today, and just disconnect. But when I would come back to the real world three months later and school would start, sort of I missed all of that connectivity with my friends and the sports and the pool parties and whatever else it was that happened. So uh, I kind of was an easy target to be the outcast of the group. That and the fact that I was pretty much the only freckle-headed ginger in town was, was making it like a double target. So you know, I want to look back and I, I really had a happy childhood, but it was plagued with different bouts of, of bullying. And, you know, it's more of a, a, a sort of a buzzword topic today. And yes, we've all been bullied, but it really impacted the way that um, I, I saw myself in belonging. And that's a theme that I still am sort of working with today is, you know, when, when your classmates sort of oust you as the ginger who is too studious and who's the nerd. Uh, they assume that you don't play sports. They assume that you're not tough. They assume that it's an easy target. And, and I was. Um, it got pretty bad to where I remember at one point I locked myself in my room and there's no locked doors that was ever allowed in the household. And that was always a thing. So when the door was locked, that was like a real big sign. And, and my dad freaked out and actually broke through the door. And I was just crying, listening to Bar uh, Bobby McFerrin's Don't Worry, Be Happy, just trying to like will myself into happiness. And 
you know, it took him about 1.2 seconds to just decide at that moment that he needed to put me into martial arts. And we were big fans of Chuck Norris and of Steven Seagal and of Jean-Claude Van Damme. Like that was our time was watching all the, you know, the karate movies and stuff. And so that really put me into a situation where I started to learn how to better communicate. And I, and I really love martial arts and I've trained martial arts my whole life. Uh, Muay Thai kickboxing to MMA, to grappling, uh, jujitsu, all that stuff. And I realized that you can't not communicate. So I learned how to carry myself in a way that made me less of a target. And I eventually went from the nerd uh, to the senior class president. And I was, uh, I lit a double life between really scholastic top of the class and then out there skateboarding and, and, and hanging out and playing hockey and, and doing what kids normally do. So now, now what that, does, what does punching people or protecting yourself from people punching you have to do with good communication? It's actually uh, before any punching happens and the way that you carry yourself. So you can have rolled forward shoulders and you can physically look like you are uh, an easy target. And by simply standing up correctly with your shoulders back, with your hands in a certain position, and even the eye contact in which you make, you can communicate. You're not somebody who's willing to be messed with. And I'm actually very proud that with my martial arts training, I was actually able to avoid any type of physical content or con any type of physical contact because I was very aware, like situationally aware. And I could understand situations before they would happen. I would make sure I didn't put myself into situations that were dangerous. And I was able to build a reputation for myself that like, whoa, you, we shouldn't mess with this guy because he's not just going to run away and cry. He's going he's gonna to actually use his words, use his body. And it's interesting how your childhood sort of ends up reflecting in your adult life. And I've been bullied plenty since uh, my childhood, but it's come more in the form of business partners. And I've had a number of situations over my history where um, I think I'm too quick to trust people because of this deep rooted sense that I feel like I want to belong. And mm -hmm. so when I am with someone and they're like, this is awesome, let's run with this. It's you and me together. Then I, I think I default to this like, yeah, let's do this. And maybe I don't see the red flags or I don't realize that I'm sort of being bullied by a business partner almost until it's too late. And I've had some uh, very successful and catastrophic failures. Um, one that actually landed me in a full-on investigation by the FTC about eight years after I had left a company. And that was when I had originally reported my business partner to the FTC eight years prior. And then it came back to bite me in the ass, but uh, I had protected myself along the way. And uh, I am here where I cannot say that my business partner has that type of freedom at this moment. So I look at each situation and relationships as a chance to learn, but there is this deep rooted like want for belonging and, and too quick to trust. Um, and I think that that's something that I'm still, you know, working on. I think we should all work on, but my childhood, uh, it was, it was great aside from all that. And just like in my adult life, you kind of work through it, but I grew up loving the ocean and I still love sailing today. Uh, I grew up playing hockey. I, I'm not, my knees are not as good as they were because I was a goaltender. And uh, martial arts, I had to, in my professional life, I had to do less because I'd come into work with just like, you know, scrapes and bruises and, and, and all kinds of like. <laughs> Looking um, like you're at a fight club or something. Exactly, exactly. And, I, and they're like, are you okay? I'm like, oh, I'm fine. I had a great workout last night. So, <laughs> no, but, um, you know, the, if my parents taught me anything, it was, uh, I'll make an analogy back to Catalina where I had to wear a life jacket until I could swim to the beach and back. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, in my adult life, I've learned how to swim because there's many times and people and things that have pulled me down to sink. And so I think that uh, I look back and I'm not like, oh, I wish that never happened. I've used it as part of my brand. I invented uh, one of the first ever anti-bullying apps for cyberbullying. Uh, I was a Southern, Cal Southern California regional manager for the Bully Project. Um, I I've, I've done a lot of uh, talks in high schools and elementary schools. I have my own bully form. Uh, it's not as front and center now, um, but it's something that's close to my heart. And I think that there's a lot of people that get bullied as adults. And maybe I, I think the root of that is that they might not be being honest with themselves or they're not ditching the act and being up front with the people that they're working with, or they just sort of think things are going to get better until a certain point where it just isn't better. 
and then you kind of deal with it. So the more I can help people be themselves and, and understand along the way that the, the truer you are to yourself, the less, the less you're going to get beat up, the less you're going to deal with uh, relationships gone wrong, and the more you can focus on what you enjoy doing. Yeah. So now in your not childhood life, but previous to the current life you have, you've been through some hard times as well as I was reading on your website. You've went through some hard experiences. And I think a lot of when we read books, business books by authors, we have a tendency to think, well, this person's just spouting some nonsense. They went and read an article and they think they know a bunch of stuff. And now they're writing about it. But then when you learn about somebody's background and you learn that, oh, this person has paid their dues, they've been through hard things in life. It's kind of like you they have more credibility. You feel like, well, they must know something because they've been through hard stuff. Tell us a little bit about the hard things that you went through professionally and such and how that's impacted things. Yeah, and I'll I'll start this with a question that I pose to a lot of people, which is, do you think people hire you for your expertise or your experience? And I'll pose that question to you real quick as a warm up. Do you think people hire you for your expertise or for your experience? Well, if I were answering that, I'd probably say it depends on the person doing the hiring. But I would think in a lot of cases, it's the experience because really what they want to do is they want to get a job done. And if I have the experience of getting that job done in the past, then they would believe I can get the job done in the future. Whereas if I only have the expertise, I mean, that could just be a certificate or something that says I can do something, but where's the proof? The experience is the proof. That's how I'd yeah. answer that. And I think that's a great answer. That, that's what I would assume is a correct answer, although they're hypothetical. So everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But I think people intuitively think that if they can convince people that they're an expert, then they will get the business or they'll get the book deal or they'll get on the podcast or they'll get the clients. But in actuality, a lot of those people who say that they're experts, they're not sharing their experience. And that makes it sort of surface level. And there's uh, maybe not as much trust or you actually don't get to know them, which doesn't allow you to really make a decision whether you like them or not. And so you don't ultimately trust them. And so, yes, I've had a lot of a lot of downs. And it's because of those experiences that people end up seeing me as an expert. So I think the best thing you can do is share your experience and let other people see you as an expert, as opposed to saying you're an expert and being timid about sharing those experiences that you've had. If I were to pull one off the shelf, uh, because there are quite a few, um, you know, I initially thought in, a, in college that I was going to, that I was, I went in undeclared. And I ended up with two majors, one in business economics and dramatic art, theater. Now, I had never known about theater prior to, but I was, uh, I, I, I was stressed out when I initially got my first set of classes. So I had my parents choose them in orientation. One of them was a theater class, but I didn't even know it. It was the first day I just showed up to the building and the teacher offered extra credit. I'm like, cool, I'm a big extra credit, you know, kind of like geek. And I didn't know what it was. <clears throat> But I, I had successfully flirted with the girl next to me first day of class. So I was feeling good. And she's like, yeah, I'm going to go. Are you going to go? I'm like, of course I'm going to go. So I went thinking that she would show up and she didn't show up. And so I was kind of down and out and some girl called my name and I thought it was her. I'm like, yeah. Uh, uh, and it was somebody with a clipboard and they called me in and they said, okay, here, read this, sit down in the chair. I was completely confused. So I read whatever it was. <clears throat> they laughed at me. I got so upset. I skateboarded home and. And I remember crying while skateboarding, which is not a normal thing. You're not normally crying on a skateboard. What ended up happening was that it was an audition. <laughs> and it was a remake of Sin City. And the character was Marv, the big crazy guy who would beat everybody up and be the, you know, like the big physical character. And I didn't see the humor in the scene because I didn't understand what was going on, but they did. So I ended up getting a part in this play of a student. And you got the part. You I did a good job. Yeah, apparently that's why so. they were laughing. <laughs> and, and I showed up and uh, and and I had no idea. Like this is my first theater experience ever. And it was such an incredible experience with the interaction of live dialogue and impact in live audience. And I was able to bring my martial arts skills to the fight scene because they were all in their MBA classes. And they're like, oh, hit like this, make a noise. I'm like, no, no, let's do this. I'm a flip. You kick it. I brought in fake glass. I brought in gut. Like I just was able to like explore this creative outlet. And 
I ended up acting, 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 producing, producing, directing, and taking over the whole student troupe. And every quarter we put on these, these really elaborate plays, but not musicals. They were like drug, sex, rock and roll, heavy hitting kind of styles. And we got so popular on campus that we started to become a threat uh, to a few places on campus. And I remember that um, there was beer found in the theater after one of our shows, which made sense because we even would hide beers under the seats as a bonus for people. Uh, and I got called in and reprimanded and we were told that we were not able to, uh, to, to basically produce any more plays. We were suspended as a group. And this is sort of a stitch of a lot of things in my life where maybe I push the envelope and then I'm told not to do something. And then that's when I get creative. And so this was a situation where I had a whole team of actors and a whole campus that was like looking forward to these uh, interesting shows. And so I applied to the College of Creative Studies at UCSB, a whole different college on the college. And I got into that college and I took an art course. And my first painting, believe it or not, is actually right behind me. I, I took this art course for no credit and it allowed me access to their old little theater. And so we put on another play under the nose of U, UCSB. Front page of the student newspaper bef the weekend before our show debuted. And I get a phone call called into Richard Jenkins' office. He slaps a paper down, I'll never forget. And he just cussed in front of everybody. He's like, what the f are you doing? I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, I suspended you, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, really? Well, I'm part of the College of Creative Studies and that's their theater. And it really doesn't have a juris you don't have jurisdiction over that. So the show's going on. That triggered him to take me and the entire uh, other leaders of this crew to campus court. And we were brought to court to potentially be kicked out of school because we had been so blatant about not following their rules. So what did we do? We came up with a whole argument around the fact that we were not a student group. We were actually SherwoodPlayers.com. We were a website. This was all brand new at the time. And so we had over 200 people in pink shirts that were there to support us outside chanting and, and creating noise while we made our presentation to not get thrown out of college saying that we are a website. We're not even a school organization. You can't hold us accountable and we're doing it over here. So we won. We won this case. Well, guess what? Our next show we put on in the main theater and we protested our own show. So we put up signs for people to not come see the show. We had like rallies on campus to, to boycott this show. And then we even created fake uh, campus police officers and we planted fake drugs on people who are our actors in line and created a whole demonstration outside just to sort of like, you know, push the envelope a little bit more. But it was one of the greatest shows ever. And uh, we actually, as a troupe, are still alive today, the Sherwood Players. We've got uh, a crazy award-winning documentary that's on Amazon Prime at this point. Uh, it's been around the world. It, it's It's just exciting to see how when I'm told, no, you can't do that, is sort of when I start to get creative. And that, I think, is a good example of uh, a challenge that I faced where I got creative and we just kept, kept pushing, and then it continues on. So th that's sort of a story off the shelf that uh, not, not many people know, but it was an exciting time, and Sherwood Players is still alive. That's great. I did not know that you had this acting in your career. It, it adds more meaning to the Ditch the Act title. So. <laughs> Now, you had kind of a rock bottom moment as well um, with losing your car and your house and all this stuff. Can you talk about that a bit? Are you willing sure. to share that? So, so, you know, I was all hopped up, ready to think that I was a great producer. And so I went to Hollywood and I'm like, well, this was after applying to just about every single master's program for film. And every single master's program for film said, no, you don't have a repertoire and a portfolio of video. I'm like, but I've done all this live theater. And they're like, we don't care. And so I didn't get into a master's program, which is pretty defeating. So I went and I got uh, an internship at ABC, at David E. Kelly Productions. I was on Boston Legal and the practice. And I was like a grunt. And I was just in there. And I was like, I'm going to be Hollywood. Well, it doesn't work like that. And everyone was like, you know, 30 years and maybe you'll have a creative choice. Well, I didn't believe them until I ran out of money. And I literally just went flat broke working for free. And a buddy of mine was working in the mortgage industry. And at that time, 2006, 2007, it was popping. So they wanted somebody with no to low experience who was highly motivated. I'm like, that sounds like me. 
So I go to their two week training and I get set up on a team and they like give me, you know, the one lead and they're like, close it and you'll get another one. I had some great mentors. I learned how to sell by building relationships with the people on the other line. That's simple. That and drawing stick figure drawings and building relationships with the processor so they process my files faster. I crushed it. I was making um, thousands and thousands of dollars a month. I, I remember I got a check for $17,000 and I was like, this is more money than I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and my parents were like, you should save it. So of course I spent it. And I bought a house and I bought a, a Rimini Red Range Rover with red rims. And I had a, a Mercedes SL500 and I was just making money and spending money. And I got arrogant enough to think that I could start my own brokerage. So I went and got my broker's license. And then I came, I came back to, to the company and I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a month off and go to Costa Rica. They're like, okay. So I went and I spent a month in Costa Rica and I came back and all my stuff was in a box. And they're like, yeah, we moved your position because you weren't here. And at that point, I was like a chairman. So I was like at the top of the company at the commission levels and everything. So I was like, you know what? I don't need you guys anymore. Give me that box. So I left and I, and I started my own brokerage. I funded my first loan and not a week later, it was 2008 when the entire market crashed. Uh. So I literally went from everything was great to just uh, the rest of the world that got cut off at the knees. And that really created that sp this spiral. I started to drink more. Uh, I took out um, the 50 or $50,000 in student loans that's now like, approaching 80 or 90 because I still haven't really knocked them off. Um, I was I was living a life that I didn't have the income to support and my house went into foreclosure. And then I had a buddy move in to help counter the rent. And then he stole my Mercedes and disappeared. And then he got a DUI and got that car confiscated. And then I hid from the creditors for like another six, eight months until they found me and snatched my car out from under me. So I literally had nothing. And the only thing I could figure out to do was file bankruptcy. Um, and I didn't even have enough money to file for bankruptcy. So throughout this whole time, I was not ditching the act with my parents. I was not really being honest with them about how bad things were. And I had to get honest with them and say, look, this is what's happened. Um, I'm going to have to move back home. And can I borrow some money to file bankruptcy? Uh, just sitting on a curb, like miserably crying, trying to even get that out. It's giving me the chills now thinking about it. Um, but I decided to. I hired the cheapest attorney possible, which means that I had to file my own paperwork. And I'll never forget putting the envelope into the mailbox and just feeling the sense of relief, but also like, you know, sorrow, agony, frustration, guilt, all that. And uh, I was like, okay, we're going to get better. I was getting organized to move into my parents' house. and. I checked the mail about two weeks later and I saw the same package returned. I was like, holy crap, that's fast. Like, I didn't know it was processed that fast. But I was actually 32 cents short on the postage. And ironically, 32 is my hockey number after Kelly Rudy, who was my idol as a kid. And I, I was just like, oh my gosh, like, it wasn't meant to be. I, I should not file bankruptcy. I can do this. And I ripped it up right there in front. I felt guilty because it was all scraps on the ground. So I picked it up, threw it away. And from that moment, I thought to myself, like the idea, I'm like, in America, it's about pulling yourself up from the bootstraps. Now, I don't wear boots, more sandals kind of guy, but I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. And so I actually ended up uh, just saying, I'm going to get any job I can. And I started working in construction, believe it or not, selling bathroom remodels. It was the worst thing ever to the ego, but I was able to use my drawing skills to help people visualize. And I started selling bathrooms and I got into construction and, and I hated it, but I still had to do it. Uh, and that was, that was my bottom to on my way back up. Now there's been <laughs> ups and downs since then, but, but again, there was just something in the world, uh, my lack of attention to detail and stamps that, that helped me get creative. Right. So again, if I look at it, there's pushing boundaries, there's, there's sort of smacked in the face. There's an opportunity to be creative and eventually just putting the work in to work myself out of it. So how did this all lead up? So you and I met in, I think, 2016. We met in Southern California. You invited me on your radio show there that was on the campus, and that's yeah. when we first met in person. And at the time, you were partners with Leonard Kim, and you guys 
a little bit later started this company, Influence Tree. But what happened during that time that led up to, hey, I'm going to write this book, Ditch the Act? What was the inspiration for the book? Yeah, I met Leonard at um, a kind of an exclusive networking event for entrepreneurs at Keith Ferrazzi's house. At the time, I was working at UCI trying to get a break. Um, uh, I was teaching entrepreneurship. I was brought to UCI to start their first ever undergraduate entrepreneurship program called Entrepreneurs because they're ant eaters. And I was trying to establish myself as a speaker um, and I didn't have any speaking experience. So I learned quickly that uh, I had to do something to create content. So I started a radio show and I was formulating this 313 method that's still strong today. And I started trying to share my thought leadership. And part of that was just networking. So I had a friend who got invited to this exclusive party and he ended up not being able to go. So he let me have the ticket. So I wasn't even supposed to be there. I don't know if you know Keith Ferrazzi, but he's he's one of- Yeah, for uh, those who don't know, Keith Ferrazzi wrote Never Eat Alone. Uh, what are some of his other- Who's books? Got Your Back. Yeah, Who's Got Your Back. And then uh, his latest one is uh, Lead Without Authority. I've got it here. I'm in the middle of reading it. But anyways, he's a best-selling he, author and he connects people, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, Never Eat Alone is probably one of the best networking books that you can purchase. And I, I had read the book. I was a big fan. So I was like all starstruck. Quick story. He brought us in uh, like this super swanky up in the Hollywood Hills, like six or seven different levels, the coolest house ever. Brought everybody into his this big main living room. And he said, okay, everybody put your phones away. Shut off all technology for a minute. I'm going to share something with you. And he proceeded to share something that was very personal, like not something that you'd think that somebody you look up to is going to share with you. And after he shared that with everybody, everybody's like, oh, damn, like he just he just got real with us right there. And he's like, the feeling that you feel right now, that's us connecting together. And if you notice, it was something that I shared that's not going right in my life. All of you have a lot of good things going on. But tonight, when you meet at dinner, you're going to have a person at each of the tables and they're going to help prompt you to share what is not going right professionally and personally. And I want you to listen around the table. And if you hear that somebody has an issue that you can help, that's where you need to connect. Because let's just assume everybody's doing fine. Everybody's got good stuff. And everybody's like, boom, like, whoa, this is crazy. So you grab a plate and on the bottom of the plate is a number which corresponds to the table. And at that table, everybody went around with a little, uh, the docent who basically said, everybody go on their turn. I stood up, the only Toastmaster in the room, obviously. So I stood up and I was like, my name's Ryan, trying to be a speaker, but nobody will hire me, trying to write, nobody reads my stuff. And I've got this 313 thing that I want to get to the world, but I have no idea how to do it. Boom. Everybody else had their challenges. And this one guy stood up and said, well, I've got like 10 million reads on my content. Everybody wants me to, to be featured in their publication. I'm not that comfortable public speaking. And my girlfriend just broke up with me. Sat down. So I thought to myself, like every person I'm intently listening to, who could I help? I was like, I could help this guy learn how to speak and get comfortable. I could show him how to possibly get a girlfriend. And I would love to learn how to get 10 million reads. And I'd love to learn how to have all these people asking me to speak. So I went up to him afterwards and I said exactly this. I said, hi, I'm Ryan. I think I can help you if you can help me. That was the beginning of it. Uh, we actually... The, the follow-up didn't work out real well, as it doesn't always, but I ran into him in Santa Monica about two weeks later, and then that sparked an actual meeting. And in true Leonard style, he said, sure, I can help you out, but it's going to cost you, um, it was over a thousand bucks that he asked for. And at this point, I was still scrapping. So I was like, okay, I got to commit. So I scratched him a check for, I think it was 1300 bucks, which is like a huge chunk at that time. And he's like, okay, write down everything that you're doing right now. I'm like, that's it? Like, that's it. Do that and get back to me. I'm like, okay. It's like some weird Yoda trick, right? So I fill out everything I'm doing. He looks at it. He's like, well, good news is you're doing everything right. Bad news is you're doing it in the wrong order. And I was like, excuse me? It's like, you're doing all the right stuff, but you're doing it in the wrong order. That's what I'm going to help you do. And that'll help build your personal brand. So one of the first things that is on the list is to actually have a website. I didn't have a website is to have a long form bio. I didn't have a bio. And Josh, as you said, you, you've known me for a while, but in reading my bio, you basically get, you get, all, the, you get all the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yep. And so uh, we worked well together because we were so different. He was a writer, I was a speaker. And he was trying to launch a course, but he's not that great on camera and he wanted somebody who was. And he asked me 
if I wanted a partner in the course. And the course was going to be outlining all the steps that I'd be going through. I'm like, this is great. So we developed a course on how to build a personal brand. And I was the test dummy. And what I did worked. And then I started getting verified on all the platforms. Then I started getting uh, featured in publications. And then I started getting traction with my speaking. And it was about a four-year process that I built that core brand. And I went from zero presence to, you know, two, 300 plus thousand followers, nice credibility. And I was able to share my experience along the way. That was the hard part for me. Wait, well, I don't want to tell people I almost went bankrupt. No, no, I don't, I don't want to tell people that I got investigated by the FTC. No, no, I don't want to tell people about the fact that I didn't do this or that. And if you don't know Leonard and you look him up, you will see most of his content is about him explaining all of the wrong things that happened in his life. And that resonates with people. Now, he's like a level five ditch the actor. And, and, and on his medium and Quora, like he gets deep and dark and people resonate with that. Now, that's a little bit that was always too much for me. But I was able to find the balance of sharing my, my backstory to let people see where I'm coming from. So they say they see the experience. And as part of this process, we were approached two different times. Uh, I think him initially and then us both secondly. Would we be interested in writing a book? So publishers so, approached you or who approached Publishers you? approached us, yes. Two different publishers. And... Uh, again, initially, I think it was through his channels because he had, uh, you know, 10 million reads and a lot of traction. So it was an outbound, which is not always the case. So we talked about it. We're like, sure. So we proposed how to build a brand as a book. And they were like, that's not compelling. Sounds like every other book out there. Um, there's no secret sauce. So we're willing to give you another chance, but you've got to come up with something unique. So we were like, okay, we actually hired uh, somebody to help us write the book proposal. And I'm sure you talk with people about this. You don't have to write a book to get it purchased. It was a big, big aha. You know, right. if you're you going write for a traditional. Proposal, book proposal, you do a query letter and you send yeah. this in so, to a publisher or you hire an agent. But Exactly. Yeah. So we so hired an agent. Yeah, we hired an agent. We hired somebody to help us tease out the book proposal. He flew in from somewhere in the United States. We actually contacted Keith Frazzi. This was like two or three years later. And we said, Keith, we met at your house. We're going to write a book. We wanted to know if we can do a full day of exploration with somebody that we hired to tease out the book in your house. And he went, sure. We're like, oh my gosh. So we drove up to LA again and he left and he, we had his entire house to ourselves for an entire day of exploratory and teasing out all of our backstories and all this, you know, like kumbaya stuff that this consultant helped us tease out. And it was fascinating. And then we got it to our agent, the final product, and we got McGraw-Hill interested. And they said, we want to buy this book. And we're like on top of the world. And they said, we will buy it for what ended up being about an eighth of what we thought we'd get for it. Mm. And we thought, this is easy. We hire this guy. We write a kick-ass you know, proposal. We get it purchased. They're going to buy it for like $200,000. And then we can use that money to pay him because he's super expensive. And the rest will go to marketing and we can just sit back and this will be great. And instead, you're just trying to figure out how to pay that first guy. hundred <laughs> percent. So the money that we got from the publisher was enough to basically cover the, the cost of the consultant to get us there. And then we got stuck with writing our own book. Now I say stuck and sure, like, you know, what a jerk. You have this opportunity. You're still saying you're stuck. It was the best thing because we actually then learned how to write this book. And we had a good outline. Um, just a side tip, one of the best things the best piece of advice that we got was to first write many chapters. We basically outlined the entire book. We're going to tell this story and do this and maybe research here an example. So we spent a lot of time on putting the whole book together as one big outline. And then we went through every night for three hours a night and we just would work on Google Docs and type and type and type. When you write a book, you really dig into the concept. And the concept that was the magic sauce that we got picked up for is this concept of ditching the act. Now, we initially sold the book as expose yourself, believe it or not. And, and it was controversial. The idea is when you expose yourself, like Keith Ferrazzi had done, um, like I started to do, like Leonard was good at, people are drawn to it because they're like, they're sucked into these stories and, and, and they find real. relatability. Yeah, it's, it's, can trust it's, it. it's, yeah, it's relatability. And so we hinged the whole thing on, if you want to build an authentic brand, 
learn how to share the things that you're not proud of, that you're embarrassed about, the silly little things that you do. Um, and that can be the backbone of getting, basically getting people to get to know you. And that was really the thread that we continue to pull. And that's what was work. That what that is what will work for me. That's what worked for Leonard. Now, when you write a book with someone, it's very intense. Um, I spent more time with Leonard during that time than I did with my fiance. Um, we got into multiple fights about content and about word choice and about different things. And some of that is natural, but uh, towards the end, it it got to a point where I think it was a bit unhealthy. And the process of me writing the book and getting so in tune with myself. And if you read the book, my story is, it's there. Like I basically spiel all of my guts in the beginning to show what it looks like to ditch the act. And then we share why you should ditch the act with examples of people from all around the world and different types of life. And then we share with you exactly how to do it. And I realized that I was not ditching the act with him or with myself. And I thought, oh, we're so far into this, you know, it, it, this partnership is going to work. It has to work. But after the book was published, the relationship got more and more toxic. There was um, not the positivity that, that was there before. And some of Leonard's personal choices of what he shared online um, as the pandemic was hitting um, made me realize that I needed to leave the company and the partnership and ultimately end the friendship. Hmm very hard decision. And uh, I actually walked away from everything. I walked away from the company. Um, I still have my half of royalties to the book, but I was not looking for drama. And there was a lot of drama. So to take, to take the analogy of the book, it sounds like you would have had to put on a mask and act in order to stay in that relationship. And you weren't willing to do that. A hundred and ninety nine percent. And it gives me the chills right now because like as a process of writing the book, it really helped me understand the importance of the message in the book, which reinforces the reason why my brand has been successful or those elements of my brand that has, have been the most successful is when I'm honest with myself and I'm honest with the world. And so I just couldn't be honest with myself unless I was in a, in a partnership that was, that was truly positive and, uh, and encouraging and, and, and supportive of each other. So it got really interesting really fast where I had a acclaimed, and I say acclaimed because we got a, a number of different awards, including the silver medal of the Nautilus Awards for the best business book of the year. Uh, we got over 83 different testimonial quotes. Like I just, I, I'm so proud of this book, but then I'm dealing with, I'm not proud of where the relationship went with my partner. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot for me to leave. Uh, it was very expensive and he did not make it an easy process. And I, uh, even as far as a couple of weeks ago, still trying to get my likeness off of the company website. And one thing that I'll, I'll share about ditching the act is the importance of not sharing in the moment. If uh, you're in the moment of something that's really challenging, it's not necessarily fair to share because it's not fair to the audience. They don't know where the outcome is. They don't know what the resolution is. If you look at a story, Josh, there's a beginning, a middle, an end, a re resolution, and there's things to learn. Mm -hmm. During this process, he was sharing in the moment, live streaming uh, behavior that I didn't find acceptable. And, and it was almost an example, the example of what we said not to do in the book. And I just couldn't feel good uh, writing a book and supporting that type of behavior that went against it. So it's a, you know. Now, now is it that he was sharing in the moment or is it what he was sharing in the moment? Cause you've got like Gary Vaynerchuk who says document don't create. And of course, Gary's out there sharing everything he's doing in real time. Yeah, but... okay, great, great distinction. So sharing in real time uh, is fine, but it's when there's drama and things are unsettled and, and things are up in the air and you're, airing grievances and you're making unhealthy decisions and you're you're putting yourself out there in a way that that makes people concerned for your safety. Mm. Yeah. There were moments that he was sharing which actually ended up in people calling to have him checked up on and and at a certain point um you know 
that actually, um, yeah, it's, it, I don't want to get into the details, but it's when you have conflict and you're sharing in real time. And so I was just trying to move on to a positive direction. So for the last year, I've not been name calling. I've not been calling out. I've not been talking about all the challenging things that have happened, but I'm getting to a point now where I feel like it's, I feel like I'm ready to now share the story and the lessons from it. And I feel stronger because of it. I feel more resolute in my own vision, mission, values, and goals. And I'm that much more proud of the book. What's, what's ironic, and, and this is something that, you know, Leonard actually will probably at a certain point realize in his life, and he talks about this in his TEDx talk, he realized that he was, his example that he was showcasing in his life well before I met him, his grandpa told him something like, you can always be an example, even if it's a, a bad example. And he talks about how he decided that what really turned the, the change for him and his branding was that he decided to say, this is what I've been doing and I'm actually a, a bad example of what to do. And, he, and, and he's talked about that a lot. So it's ironic that he helped write the book for sort of best practices on being authenticity. And he has since become an example, at least that I can point to, of some of the things not to do that will drive people away from you. I was close friends with him. We had a business together. We were making money. We wrote a book together. But he drove me away. He drove other people away. It's his mm -hmm. choice. And for some people, it draws it to them. And then that's fine. But be careful when you're sharing in the moment things that are emotional and that are intense and that are conflict-driven. Uh, I can now share because I have a full story and a loop end where I can share in context of the learnings. And I think this still stitches back to me being bullied, sort of overlooking some red flags um, and, and wanting to belong to something and a company that I built. But it's okay. The final thing I'll say is that I've always told people the power of a personal brand is that it's an insurance policy. For the last five years, my name is Ryan Fullen. My website is ryanfullen.com. And if you want to know about my business, well, yeah, that's influencetree.com. And so when I had to make this really challenging move, nothing changed from my messaging. It's still, I'm Ryan Foland. This is who I am. This is what I'm doing. It's just now that I don't have Influence Tree as a company that I'm doing. And oftentimes as entrepreneurs, and I've done this a number of times, hey, Ryan, what's up with you? Don't worry about me. It's this new company. This is what I'm doing. This is, my, this is what my product is. And if that product fails or you pivot to something else, then you have to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. but with building a brand, I realized that my brand is who I am, regardless of what company I'm either owning or advising on or, or something like that. And so for me, building my personal brand, and Leonard was helpful in understanding the order in which to do it, that uh, I'm very thankful for him, but uh, it, it is unfortunate, but I've, I've made the healthy choice for me to end that relationship and move on. And so I guess it, it makes for all a good story at the end of the day. Um, maybe, uh, maybe might be fodder for uh, a new book, a few books down, and maybe you can help me tease that out. Well, Ryan, for the audience, Ryan and I talked about this before we started recording because I know Leonard too. And I met Leonard years. I actually met Leonard before I met Ryan and it was through Leonard that I met Ryan. And so Leonard's a friend of mine too. And, but I thought, you know, this is a useful learning experience because, Writing a book with a co-author is like starting a business with a partner, and sometimes like getting into partners, a relationship. It's really a your your yeah, you're, it's a relationship. Yeah, and sometimes things work out, and sometimes they don't work out. And I thought this would be really helpful for somebody out there who's thinking of bringing on a co-author, or is in the middle of a relationship with a co-author, or is trying to figure out how to split from a co-author. But there's some red flags here. There's some warning signs. There's some tips here on how to do things, how not to do things, or what can happen. Because when you're starting a business, it's just, everything's going to be great. And when you start a book, everything's going to be great. And then when things get tough, you realize, gee, maybe I don't really like working with this person. Maybe it's this person's fault that things aren't going so well, or maybe we just don't jive or something. And so I think this is a real raw look at that, that you know, things might not work out. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a co-author or a business partner, but it does mean you should go in with your eyes wide open and you should examine things clearly. 
So if you were talking to somebody who's thinking about bringing on a co-author, Ryan, what are some of the tips you would give them to say, here's some things to think about before you jump into this relationship? I would ask them this question. Are you willing to have a baby with this person? <laughs> and and I say that in all seriousness because uh, I feel like that's, I feel like Leonard and I had a child, okay? And the child is this book. And we have since gotten divorced. And I always uh, felt it like, it, you know, you, you know people that get divorced, and you know people that have kids, and you know how they have to co-parent. And I've always thought like, gosh, that is just sounds so difficult to have like, to, to just to, to have some living piece of being in the world, but not be together. And then the, just the different, like for me, I've just always thought that's so crazy. And then that is exactly what I feel like has happened. Yeah. You're splitting custody of your book. Yep. But I love the book. I love this baby, but it also like is a challenge because I have no control over what he does with it. It's just as much his book as it is mine. Mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> the, the irony of the whole thing is that m the biggest challenge in me building my brand is is has been being vulnerable and letting people understand that I'm not perfect and that I'm not all these things. Because I grew up thinking you fake it till you make it. Like th I had shiny cars because that's what the business people that I was running with said to do. And like there's certain images reality and all that has been myth busted. And so for me to be able to come out and share that this is happening. Like I was always fearful of the optics and it's just like, but it's happening and it actually feels good to share it. So would you want to have a baby with this person? I think that's a really good question because, and look at this pandemic. I mean, we all have extra stresses on our life. Like I'm not saying any of this is Leonard's fault. I'm saying that the relationship got to a point where I realized it was not healthy for me. And whether you have a business partner now or in the future, you have to, you have to understand that things are going to change. People change. So do you want to have a baby with this person is number one. Um, the other is, what do you want to do with the book? And I think you're, I'm sure you'll, you talk or address that, but like once you have a book and you have a stack of 50 of them and then you're like, wow, it's here. Then you're like, why isn't it selling? <laughs> what, what, yeah. why are people not buying the book? And so it's such a, it's, it's, it's really hard to sell books right now. I'm not saying uh, I'm not saying don't write a book and the book on its own is a brand builder and all these things. But what do you want to do with the book? I wanted to speak professionally and charge twenty thousand dollars a keynote. And I was on that track and I landed a couple and then the pandemic hit. And, and so, you know, hiring just, speakers all of a sudden. <laughs> so so do you want to have a baby with this person? And what do you truly want to do with the book? And if you are writing a book with a business partner, you have to know you. I would always say like, play out the options, just play to yourself. What if we publish this book and then we broke up? Like go through that thought process. Um, I don't think I went through that thought process initially. And when I realized that something was really going wrong, it was too late. We had signed the contract. We needed to deliver it to the publisher. And so I remember for the last rush and push of this book, it was, it was, it was very challenging. So mm -hmm. will I have another co-author? Probably not. Um, that's me personally because I've gone through it. So I've learned through that experience. Should you have a, a, a co-author? It made the writing a lot easier. Leonard's way stronger of a writer than I am. So if it was just me, this book wouldn't be as strong. Um, that's what I would say. Do you want to have a baby? And what do you actually want to do with it? <laughs> so now you said that you did sell 100 books last week. So yeah. what are you doing to sell it now? So uh, through speaking engagements, that's really the only traction that I found. So I'm doing a, an entrepreneurial show. And how are you doing speaking engagements during lockdown? Oh, virtual. Uh, you know, I think that once lockdown happened, I actually doubled down on created content, uh, created ginger snips, showing m myself on stage all the time, um, outbound, a lot of inbound. And I, I've, been, I've been landing quite a few. Um, I actually just spoke in Ireland the other day. Uh, I've spoken in the, the Caribbean and Haiti. Um, all, all, all of this, because I just haven't changed what I've been doing. I've just been saying it's just a change delivery. Mm -hmm. And if somebody doesn't want to pay the fee that I charge, then I'll say, well, next step is you buy a book for everyone there. And if that doesn't work, then it's like the next level. How can I get added value from that? Well, if you're not going to pay me, you're not going to buy books. I need the email address and permission to email them. And if it's, if it's not that, it's probably not going to make sense. But yeah, 
the biggest chunks that I've sold is through speaking gigs. And now that I have a book, which I didn't have before, I'm able to use that as one more leverage, one more tool to sell them. A question. When you sell books in bulk to an event organizer, do you ship the books to them or do you tell them, hey, go on Amazon and buy a hundred books and then I'll do this speaking gig? A different action options scene, none of the above. Um, McGraw Hill has a whole fulfillment center. So it's super easy and I just connect them with them. And based on the amount that they're buying, that's the discount that they get. It's out of my hands. I don't do any shipping. Now, I will say that I always have 50 books on hand. There's there's probably 47 right here. So I always have 50 books on hand so that in a pinch, if it's a smaller event, I'll cut them a deal and I'll work with them directly that I can like either bring them to because shipping 50 books is like cuts all your profits. They're gone. Yeah. So I like to have the actual publisher facilitate it. And for me, I feel like that's a whole nother level of professionalism. It's like, no, you're not just going to buy books from me. Uh, I'm going to connect you with McGraw Hill and they'll take it from here. Cool. So What's the future then with Ditch the Act? Where are you taking it? Where are things going? Well, I think it's always going to be a part of, of how I'm sharing what I think works best in building a brand. Um, and that's sharing more than just the good. Um, I've got a couple killer keynotes around it. Every time I do a keynote, it's very customized. Um, I will also mention that there are 70 stick figure drawings in the book, which I'm very excited about. And all of my keynotes are hand-drawn. So I think I'll continue to get traction more so than ever right now because people are forced to understand the importance of a digital footprint. They are confused as to what to share online. And I think if you look at some of the most successful personal brands, I mean, you ditch the act all over the place. Like you're very honest and upfront with your story. And I've seen you speak all over and that's a big part of it. It's, it's, it's ingrained in what you're doing. But there are still people who think that only showcasing the shiny good stuff is the way to connect. But I will continue to tell people that people don't care about your story of success. They care about how they see themselves in your story. And if your bio doesn't showcase that you're human or share what went wrong, it's not showcasing your expertise. It's not going to support um, from your experience. And so I'm going to keep riding this horse until the wheels fall off. I, I want this book to be the modern day uh, uh, how to influence friends and how to how to influence people and win friends. Dale Carnegie. I'm how to win, win friends, friends and influence people and influence people. Yeah, <laughs> I think this is a modern day uh, Dale Carnegie book where it really just gets at being more human. So this has a long shelf life. Uh, it will continue to go. At least I'm going to be continuing to push it. I do have a whole series of books that I believe I'll be publishing next. Happy to talk with you about it but they're going to be stick figure books. Uh, they're going to be focused on some, uh, some core concepts that I'm passionate about, but through stick figure format. Uh, and tell, I've actually Tell us for the audience, the people who don't know you, tell us a little bit more about your history with stick figures. Well, I've always drawn uh, and I've always been passionate about finding like my own stick figure people. Um, my design one in high school for the senior class shirt um, I use stick figures when in my mortgage business to build relationships with processors. I draw stick figures on the front that had to do with what they liked. My things would get processed faster. Uh, it's always been a part of who I am, but as part of my brand, I've been showcasing stick figures uh, since 2015. I didn't know how I was going to get on Instagram. I didn't know what to share. And I was at a Tony Robbins event and he challenged me to do something every day that doesn't take more than 10 to 15 minutes. And that was, for me, to draw a stick figure every day. So I'm five years later, every platform, every day, I share a stick figure, which now have masks on to be socially uh, distant. <laughs> but uh, I also illustrated this book, two or three other books. And there's just something powerful about stick figures. I think we can all relate to them. And so stick figures for public speaking, stick figures for building your brand, stick figures for productivity, stick figures for soft skills. I see almost like a, uh, like a, you know, a dummies four version, but in stick figure format. And I turned 40 this year, whoop, whoop, but I had to cancel my big, exciting party because of COVID. So I channeled my energy into a pandemic project and I launched stickfigure.store. It's all for charity. And so now I have this sort of new fun passion project of bringing awareness around the stick figures to raise money for causes that, I, that I'm excited about. So 
if you can find something that you enjoy doing that also creates content that ties in with your brand, it's like the sweet spot of like actually enjoying doing the work that you do. And I love drawing stick figures and creating a visual to different ideas from my PowerPoint slides to images in a book to stick figures on Instagram. Awesome. Now I want to back up just a little bit. I know this sounds like we're wrapping things up, but before we do that, uh, tell us about working with McGraw Hill with your publisher and what that experience was like, because some people have positive experiences. Some people have kind of mediocre experiences. What was it like? What did you learn from that publishing experience? So overall it was positive. Uh, our editor was great. Uh, the communication was good, but what I don't think people realize is that <laughs> is the amount of work you still have to do, even though you have an editor. We wrote the book and we hired an editor to help us edit our work. And we hired somebody else to help edit that person's work. And the way that we delivered to the publisher was almost perfect, to which then they could come back with their edits that we would re edit and run through our two consultants as well. Mm -hmm. The publisher's job is to put polish on what you're doing. They're not there to basically work through every chapter and, and give you feedback every single time. They're not They're, there to fix your mess. No, no, no. And, and I didn't realize that. Also, they are not there to sell your book. <laughs> they are there to place it into Barnes & Noble, if, if, if that's the case. But they're not throwing marketing dollars behind it. They're right, not unless on... you're Obama or Hillary Clinton or something. Right, right. But... They're... People people don't realize that the marketing of the book falls solely on the author. And however much you want to think that McGraw-Hill is this big titan that's going to help you sell books, no, they're a big titan and there's a great credibility that comes along with it. And that was part of the reason we wanted to go with traditional publishing. But you better you better expect to deliver that thing as polished as possible because that's that's what they want to do. They just want to look at it, give you some insights and go from there. I will also go back to this idea of a, of a book proposal. I really thought that you had to write a book to be bought. Y your agent will present a book proposal that, that they're going to read maybe the whole thing. And there's a specific format and different ideologies on how to do that. But they basically buy an outline of the book. And then it's your responsibility to actually write the book. Mm -hmm. And so... I thought we'd get a lot more support in that writing process, but it was more so like, we bought the concept, send me chapters one through five when you're done with them. And it's like, wait, what? Oh, crap. And so we actually hired two different consultants to help um, polish along the way, which, which was instrumental. Having help writing your book is instrumental because just like you don't see your keys, even though they're right in front of you, you don't see phrases and words and things from an editing standpoint. You don't see some of the conceptual stuff. And then where they were helpful um, is in some of the things that you know you have to get done, like the title or like the book cover and the title. After they bought the book, they're like, yeah, we got to change the title. Like, oh, crap. And then once we were working on the title design, their title, their, their cover design, I'm sorry, was not impressive. Like it was like they, they just outsourced it to somebody who came up with an idea. We got really involved. And if you're listening, you can't see this, but we actually created this uh, design that has like stick feet, I'm sorry, that has like post-it notes that have been ripped open. So there's this 3D effect. And on each of the post-it notes, it says like happiness, success, and they're like ripped in half. And so we want it to like pop, to like jump out on the shelf. And we went back and forth so many times to, to get what we wanted. I was amazed at how I think the publisher looked at it as like, come on, let's get this off the list. And we're like, no, this, this is really, really important to us. And the final thing I'll say is that if you ever negotiate a contract, by golly gosh, make sure it's something about an audiobook that you are able to be the voice of. Josh, I was so upset when I found out that when it came, because the audiobook was part of it. Right. But when I was told that we had to hire a professional voice actor to do it, I was not cool with it. And when yeah, every- like I'm a professional voice actor. I know what yeah, I'm doing. I, I can read this. <laughs> this is going to make this book come alive. I listen to audiobooks all the time. And when it's somebody else reading it, it's not as great as Gary Vaynerchuk reading his own book. And so I was so upset. I actually um, almost like 
almost risked my entire relationship uh, with my editor, Emma McGraw Hill, going up the chain saying, not acceptable. I want to be able to have the right to do it. And it didn't work. We had to hire somebody else because that all had to be negotiated ahead of time. And the options that they gave us were all old white men. Okay. And so I was like, no, we're not going to have some 65 year old reading a book about like modern, modern social media and how to put yourself out there online. Like it just, it just doesn't connect. Yeah. When I'm on the Facebook, do I have the internet? (laughs) (laughs) And so um, my only saving grace is that I said, look, um, if you're not going to let us do it, then we want a female to read it because we don't want anyone to think that this voice is ours and we want to incorporate a, a female voice and have more gender equality because it's two dudes writing a book. So I felt good about having a female voice. Um, but again, that was just a really frustrating part of the process. Mm. That is tough. This is great advice though. This is great for aspiring authors who just have no clue what they're going to get into as a first time author. And if I was just saying it was peachy and rosy and everything was great because I want you to think that that uh, I'm a published author and everything's fine, then then the real learning wouldn't be there. And that's an example of like actually ditching the act to say like, yeah, it was it was actually there's there's some real challenges with it. So that's an example of like actually connecting with people. I don't think you judge me, and I don't think anybody else judges me for what happened in that process. But I think you and your listeners appreciate opening up about it. So don't be afraid to just continue to open up. And it may feel a little bit like nerve wracking because you want to make everybody think it was an amazing process, but like it was, it was not easy. The three, three years, Josh, from the original concept of us being willing to write a book to it being published three freaking years. It's about, it took about the same amount of time as I've known you. So (laughs) Yeah, but that's what people say is that when you go traditional publishing, expect it to take a one one to two years longer than you think it's going to take. You yeah. write the book in the year in a year and then you wait a year or two for it to get published. So your experience fits right in line with that. But I'm proud of my baby. It's okay. And uh, you know, I'll co-parent and I'll do the best that I can to to make the relationship work in a uh in in the most decent way possible. But uh I feel like I'm definitely a single parent on this one. Wow. Thank you so much, Ryan, for spending this time and giving us these insights into your book, Ditch the Act. Once again, where's the best place to get a hold of you and learn what you're all about? So my website and uh, an easy way to find me is just go to ryan.online. Think of Ryan, forget my last name for a moment, put a dot and then put online and that'll, that'll bring you to my main website. I also have two podcasts if you're interested. One is where I work people through my 313 process, which is a lot of fun. And you can go to ryan.online forward slash 313 challenge. And my World of Speakers podcast, uh, we're at 82 episodes where I, I, uh, I bring on speakers who I respect and we talk about the business and practice of speaking. Uh, and uh, you can find that at ryan.online forward slash capital W-O-S. Or just Google my name, it'll all pop up. But uh, if you like stick figures, you can follow me on Twitter. And if uh, you want daily slices of life, uh, I'm I'm definitely more into giving those post writing a book, sharing who I am and what I'm thinking. All right, thank you so much, Ryan, for all the value you've given us today. This has been awesome, and I'm sure our listeners are loving listening to this. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Josh. Thanks for all you do. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star rating review and tell your friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you're an entrepreneur interested in writing and publishing a nonfiction book to grow your business and make an impact, visit publishedauthor.com for show notes for this podcast and other free resources. 